officially welcome to the first session of the juxtaposition lecture series of the Studium Generale at the Berlin University of the Arts in 2022. My name is Lukas Feireis and as part of my visiting professorship here at the school, it's my deliberate aim to promote wild thinking and thinking the wild across all disciplines, intuitive, fragmented, non-systematic, and ambivalent. Um, and this, let's say, wild style approach appears to be, at least in my opinion, the best way to do justice to the extraordinary complexity and the extraordinary diversity of the world in which we live. So the intention of this weekly lecture series um, is to broaden our minds and promote a critical discourse across binaries, across boundaries, borders, disciplines, norms, forms, and protocols, and celebrate really the power of cross-pollination, of creative entanglement, and of also non-binary collaborations, and embrace the beautiful juxtapositions that make up our lives. That said, um, I'm thrilled to welcome um, today Kenyan visual artist, writer, and teacher Isaac Karayuki, who's joining us from London. Hi, Isaac. I'm Hi. Yeah, thrilled to, to have you here with us today. We've been talking a little bit before and um, to also introduce kind of our connection to the students. Um, I came across your work through this kind of three-part publication that you did in Diaspora Drama, kind of a design or kind of little underground publication which explores young creative people of color with the overarching themes of the internet and technology which a friend of mine sent me a link to and then a couple of years later i saw your work again in an exhibition and publication called digital imaginaries and um now you're here with us today i'm, I'm, I'm really grateful for that and um, your work um uh, as a visual artist an editor and a writer evolves around topics of displacement or diaspora and surveillance, in particular of minority groups and, and, and the internet uh, in relation to the global south. Uh, and thereby you work in many different forms of media, such as video and sculpture and photography, I think where you originally come from, 3D art and also performance lectures. Um, Born and raised in, in Kenya, I believe in Nairobi, you studied in the UK and you hold an MA from Central St. Martins with a kind of focus on digital art. You have exhibited worldwide and you have also lectured in many different institutions at the Tate Britain, at the Chelsea College of Arts and currently at the Camberwell College of Arts in London. And um, you write, uh, you write for many magazines, um, based Elephant, Garage, but also the New York magazine to mention but a few. So welcome, Isaac. I'm very happy that you're with us and uh, the screen is yours. Thank you. Hey, everyone. Um, well, first I want to say thanks to Lucas and um, pretty much everyone else involved in making this whole program of lectures happen. So yeah, thanks all around. Um, so before I start, I wanted us to do a small exercise. It's not a guided meditation, but it's a small exercise. I've done this before um, in person, so this is the kind of abbreviated version. So it's only going to be two steps. So wherever you are, I want you to first, with your right, with your dominant hand, I want you to draw a square in the sky, in the air, like that. You can do that right now. Um, if you can't use your hands, you can like just like dart your eyes around. And then after you're done with that, I want you to clench your fist, whichever fist you want. If you can't do that, like stare just directly at you at whatever surface is near you. And open your fist and look at your palm. And I want you to imagine your house keys on it. And I want you to imagine what they look like, remember what they look like, the shape, the kind of grooves the edges, where it's jagged and where it's smoother, how reflective the metal is, if there's a keychain attached, maybe, you know, all the details, all the colors, all the kind of fine lining going on there. And then I want you to kind of ask yourself, how well did you imagine that? 
Uh, so this was a memory exercise that I used to do. Um, it's cobbled from a bunch of different memory exercises that um, I did a couple years ago. Well, now you can let, you can let go. You're you're fine now. But I essentially did that around 2017, 2018, when I was very like forgetful and I used to misplace a lot of things. Um, I lost my passport like three times. I lost my ID a couple of times. I lost my debit cards maybe six times. I actually lost my ID again three months ago. But I it was a huge burden on my life. And there was a period where uh, I got really nervous that maybe I was having like some like neurolog neurological problems or I was, yeah, like neurological de uh, degenerative disorders or some cognitive problems going on. And that's why I you know, went on free websites about um, mental exercises and like P I read PDFs on how to do those things. But the biggest challenge really was when I didn't have like my ideal passport of debit card, I was, a lot of things were foreclosed on me, obviously. I couldn't, like all the official channels of getting your life done and being a productive person was foreclosed. And I won't get into the specifics, but you can imagine that navigating like Western Europe or something without documents or a debit card for an extended period of time is an excruciating experience. Uh, and, you know, yeah, it just imagine going, trying to get a library card or something, you need kind of official doc, you need to prove your address and things like that. And to prove your address, you kind of need official documentation. You know, it is very labyrinth like and excruciating. So, so in that period, I was thinking, okay, what's the flip side, right? Like what, I'm curious what, how, it might look to someone as a positive thing that they don't have the official documentation going on, that their formalized copies of their selfhood was not present. Like if that's what kind of, how would that look beneficial to someone? And not in the way of returning to like nature or like becoming a libertarian or entering like a hippie commune, because that's not necessarily like destroying your, um, institutional like classification that's more um cultural rejection or personal taste but i'm talking about i'm thinking of moving through the world as like non-existent to the state and what that will look like on a daily basis and where you are not you know not existent not just the state but like all the actors that support the state so like the banks for instance and several institutions uh so this is largely like largely like the question i ask in pretty much all my artwork and all my writing basically and with that i found yeah through this research i found a document from or a report from the home office which is the kind of uh immigration governmental body in the uk and i found an uh, investigation an independent investigation about unresolved asylum seeker cases across the UK. And I'll read a sentence about one of their findings about uh, what happens when an asylum seeker's application is rejected. So this is a sentence. Travel documents are key to removing people from the UK who do not have valid approval to remain. We have found that such applicants may deliberately destroy or misplace their travel documents to delay their removal, uh, end quote. So I found that quite interesting. Like, obviously, it was a short term benefit for the asylum seeker who now was buying time, basically, in order to find a solution to now their rejected statehood within the UK by destroying them themselves and is essentially going underground. Now they are no longer part of the surface world, they've entered the underground. While I say that, while I use that kind of imagery, um, they haven't like transcended the material world. <laughs> They're very much present in our world. And I'm talking about like refugees, you know, people who have been human smuggled, you know, victims of human trafficking, victims of like failed adoption processes. Um, they don't exist as ghosts. Like people who are undocumented exist without any kind of supernatural mystical elements or dimensions. They're very much a part of our world. And this is kind of what all my work is about. Like I want us to consider 
that the existence of people outside of society, you know, in fact, what kind of lubricates the machine that keeps like the capitalist world running, they've not disappeared, they're merely functioning in tandem with our world. And if you want to have a broad kind of conception and try to understand the unified whole of human existence and consciousness and how to salvage that from kind of the sledgehammer of oppressive modern day, then you have to consider people who live in the margins or people who've been dropped off the margins of our world. So, and you have to think about that breathlessly, like all the time. Uh, so I, yeah, I want you to just keep that in mind as I get into my presentation and yeah, talk about my work. Um, I'm going to run through pretty much the most relevant stuff that has to do kind of with my practice or the, yeah. So I might leave, I'll leave out like a couple of projects I don't think are relevant to this talk, but feel free to ask me about them any other time. Uh, okay, so I will start sharing my screen. Can everyone see that? Okay, yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so, so this is. I want to start with a project that pretty much is like unifies my all the all the ideas I just talked about. So this is Precious Metals from uh, 2020. It was commissioned by Arbeit Gallery in London. Um, I they came to me and said, "Hey, we're doing a." Uh, an exhibition on the term power play, you know, asking if I had any work I was considering right now. And I told him, yeah, I was really interested in, I've been really fascinated by uh, the concept of the gray market. And to briefly state it, basically there's the clear market and the black market. The clear market is the most transparent, obvious, you know, buying and selling of goods and services. So like Amazon, uh, buying stuff in your grocery shop, yeah, going to the street and like buying something like that's that's a clear market. It's all there right in front of you. There's no mystical elements to it. And then there's the black market. Obviously, it's like in the shadows, usually illegal. So mm, buying marked guns from like the dark web or buying drugs, things like that. But and then there's the gray market, which is sits somewhere in between the two of them. And where how I describe the gray market is, it's basically like corrals back and forth between legal and illegal. And it's usually like unauthorized distribution channels, but it's not necessarily, the goods that they're selling are not necessarily illegal. It's just how they do it. That makes it kind of um, suspect. So like if, a vendor has an excess amount of goods, they sell them like at a discount, like in the back room or how the mafia um, says the products just like fell off the truck or something. Um, that's kind of the gray market. But then, there's, but then there's people who live in the gray market. And what I mean by that is say someone who had to migrate from like the countryside into the city or migrate from uh, one continent to the next, and they're confronted by a system that has shut its doors on them, has foreclosed, again, I keep using that word, but because they don't have the right papers, they don't speak the language, there's you no know, variable reasons why everything's foreclosed on them. And uh, what happens is the only opening they have is the gray market. So they'll be, because they don't have like, resident papers to like rent a house, they'll rent from a very dodgy like landlord, for example, or they'll get jobs that are under the table, things like that. So some people kind of maneuver in the world from the moment they wake up to the moment they go to bed, they're in the gray market. They don't interact at all with the clear market because it just is unwelcoming to them. And I was also thinking about, okay, what, I don't want to. I don't want to put a face to this, to this idea. I want to instead um, have an artifact that kind of embodies that idea. 
and what artifacts are kind of in the gray market. And I think for me, it's precious metals, the title of the project, because precious metals are basically like gold, silver, rhodium, stuff like that. Um, they go back and forth between the gray, uh, between like legal and illegal, the prices fluctuate, things of that nature. And so I went on the dark web. I learned how to go on the dark web and I bought a bunch of really expensive watches that had precious metals in them um, that either like that could have been from the factory and someone stole them that, or like an employee from the factory, like just swiped them, who knows? Uh, yeah, and I just displayed them in the exhibition because I just didn't want to have like, a, I didn't want to just have like a humanist kind of element to it. Like I wanted it to be about these objects to make you think about, um, yeah, what it, what it means to be in the gray market. Uh, so yeah, these are, these are the watches. And on the right is a video that I, yeah, like a 3D uh, video that I made to coincide with the, with the work. Um, the captioned text is basically a bunch of reviews of the watches that people are leaving on the dark web on like the marketplace that I bought these watches from. And there's a lot of stories that people are telling and yeah, I found it very poetic, and so that's why I added it. Uh, and this is kind of research and like other ideas I was thinking about. So on the top left is actually what um, a screenshot of some of yeah one of the vendors who was actually selling uncut diamonds. Um, and by the way, all these the marketplace that I was buying the stuff from it shut down, so there's no really. I don't think there's anything um, strange about me showing uh, any of this. Um, on the right is the is actually one of the watches that I bought. Like, and the person who I bought it from was called Sexy Homer because um, he liked he actually liked Homer the philosopher and had a poem about him on his page. And on the bottom, it's a screenshot of like an idea I was thinking about. Basically, there's a lot of people who think like watches can attract women, like hypnotize them on YouTube, but I might just like leave that on the side. If anyone is interested in like following whatever this, whatever's going on here, be my guest. I'm not, I don't think it's my avenue. I'm not really that keen on like the manosphere, men's rights kind of side of the internet. Like, like I'm really on the dark web. I don't think this is like, I don't want to keep intoxicating myself further. Um, but yeah, so that's precious metals. Um, it's in its entirety so far. I think it, I still have a long way to go in terms of like this buying and selling of like precious metals in the dark, the dark web, and also like in the clear web. Like, there's so many. Like, I don't know if you go to if you go to a sh like if you go to a jeweler. Like, how do you know they bought those? They have those diamonds or whatever. Like in a in a um, through like good channels like. There had to be some exploitation in the process, you know? But yeah. So the next thing I want to talk about is an essay I wrote um, in 2019. It's called, Is Online Piracy an Art Form? This is for uh, Garage Magazine. And the subheading is, Imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, also the defining aesthetic of our time, probably. Uh, I was thinking a lot about piracy yet in 2019 because I was well I was thinking about precious metals because I was just uh, yeah I was curious about like illegal stuff happening online that's kind of the the clear thing that's present in all my work so I approached Garage and I said I want to write a praising piece about piracy online piracy because I think a lot of people when especially in the arts, when they think of, talk about piracy, they'll just say like, yeah, it's like anarchic, it's fighting the system. It's like, it's brash, it's like in your face, they're doing something rebellious. But I'd say actually that's, it's kind of the complete opposite because piracy was the internet before what it is right now. It was computing, basically early days of computing. Um, people would make softwares for free and then pass it around to whoever would want to test it out, be it other 
engineers, software engineers, uh, professors, uh, just like people who just loved com computer enthusiasts. They play around with it, tinker with it, fix bugs, give it back, back and forth until like the thing was better each time. But then it, but then because of the forces of like Steve Jobs or something um, and Bill Gates, they wanted to profit off of um, computers and software. So they, they infringed like kind of copyright with their softwares and made people buy like Microsoft and Microsoft Office and things like that in order to like actually make money from this technological event that was meant to like liberate us or like make or like further us but instead they wanted to make money and that's why and that's how we have piracy now and so pirates keep evolving and finding ways to outrun kind of the police of you know the internet or like of software and stuff and that's what I was interested in is the really interesting ways they do it because a bunch of it gets really goofy like the screenshot I have on the right it's for um the musical Hamilton it's on it's on Pornhub under the name Revolutionary Twinks Have Historical Fun and um also like Prince, when Prince's whole catalog was not on streaming or anything, you'd find it on YouTube with like the most ridiculous names and things like that. And people make their own artwork just to evade any kind of detection that this was an illegal thing. So I thought like this was a really great art art form happening. Oh, sorry, I wanted to mention um, this was in the cover for the um, for the essay. It's from the movie. I was trying to watch the movie Zodiac and on and like online for free and I came across on YouTube a copy of the movie but it was inside like a stock image of like a Samsung like poster like an ad for the Samsung TV so I'll I'll, I'll read like a paragraph about that the video disregarded compositional symmetry Zodiac played at a severe slanted angle facing a frozen stock model. The audio was sped up and lifted to a chipmunk pitch, probably to distract the automated infringement scanners. This is all to say that the movie was reasonably unwatchable, but that's the ethos of piracy, a promise of substance, but a showcase of dark comedy. I was really proud of that last sentence, but basically I wanted to yeah, say that in the end, like pirates are kind of making fun of the um of the kind of the mechanics of the internet and like what what happens when um when people try to have control of this thing everyone has access to they're gonna kind of lampoon it and prank it and i also wanted to mention that pirating is also kind of the default outside of the west um in eastern europe in africa South, in asia like it's more prevalent than it is in the West, I think, because also they just don't have the same relationship to um, these companies and they don't have the kind of access that people in the West do. So that's kind of the overarching theme. I want to be like, I want to say like, hey, they, sure, they're pirating it, but they're also making their own translations and doing all these kinds of inventive things to these pirated movies, for instance. So that was the essay and that's kind of what it was about. So the next piece that I, I think following on the theme of, well, actually kind of coming out of the theme of um, illegality and things like that, but this was uh, coding braiding transmissions. It was a project that, uh, a collaboration between me and Tamar Clark Brown, um, who's a frequent collaborator with me. We, Tamar came, up to me and said, I've had this idea for coding and braiding, but I just don't know where to take it. Like I just have the idea or just have those two words together. And so we brainstormed a lot and I brought up the idea of how do we turn like the action of braiding hair into code. And so we teamed up with a coder and we basically, okay, so I'll try to explain it. So on the image on the right, um, the 
the models that we have are wearing uh, GoPro cameras and they're braiding each other's hair, right? So, but at the same time, there's an Xbox Connect. I don't know if you guys know about that, but it's like, it's like a Nintendo Wii. Like it's a, it's a thing that just, yeah, um, it scans like, you, it knows which one's your right hand and which one's your left hand. So we outfitted, we like, we dug inside it and outfitted it to, so that it knows that when the right hand does a certain braiding position and the left hand goes a certain way, that's a language. And therefore you can make sentences out of that language. And basically we wanted to make it that the models were sending each other messages while they were braiding hair, but it just looks like they're braiding hair, but actually they're having a conversation. And in the exhibition space, you can see there's a projector somewhere and you can see the little text paragraphs going on of them talking. And um, it was a highly technical, um, very precarious kind of um, installation going on because Xbox Connect has been out of commission since I think like 2015. So there's, yeah, so if you mess it up, like they won't, Xbox customer care won't help you or, and there's not many people who actually can fix it and things like that. Um, we were basically, yeah, it's a very precious thing, but once it works, it works. And the kind of elements around it was, it was about like escaping surveillance because they are jumping around surveillance by just pretending to with each other's hair. And like in an ideal world, you know, so in the summertime, they'll, you'll just see two people uh, braiding each other's hair like outside their house, like on the steps of their house, but actually they're having a full on conversation. So that was the idea that we had. And we did our research. We actually discovered um, a historic event in what is now known as Colombia. There was some of the slaves, well, the, basically when the men were um, working the land, the women were pretending to like wander around, just like walk around because some of them were pregnant or some of them were caring for another woman. So they weren't working, but they were actually pretending, but while they were pretending to like walk around lazily, they were actually mapping out uh, directions of escape. But, and then in the evening, they braid those patterns onto the hair, like of how to escape. And then they'll, in the middle of the night, that's when they'll all escape in those braided patterns. And that was the inspiration that we got. It's like, there is a resistive element to this, to, like hair technique that is highly politicized, obviously like black people's hair is highly politicized, but there's also this thing of like, you can also use it to escape like institutional powers, which I found very, like even way more impactful. And um, I won't get into it too much, but they're all wearing the same t-shirts because we also pretended to be a startup. Um, so they're wearing startup t-shirts and in the exhibition, once you enter the space, you're in our like, um launch party or whatever because we're also we're also mocking mm, how a lot of tech startups are just covert um uh surveillance operators that sell your data by the way your data is actually not that useful but it's a whole bubble about to burst anyways but so that was kind of the elements that we had there yeah and this is kind of how the exhibition looked like and the one at the front has their phone because they're reading the text messages that's been sent to them. But yeah, I'm really, we're really proud of this. We're gonna have different iterations because I don't think, I think surveillance as a concept is ever changing. It keeps just like, I guess just like neoliberalism, it keeps moving and changing with the times so that it disappears into kind of the fabric of our world. So while we, think of as surveillance with like cameras and CCTV cameras probably won't look the same in five years. Like we'll actually be surveilled in different elements. Like when I tell people, when I see people with their, um, their laptop webcams with like a sticker on it, I'm just like, okay, cool. But they can still like turn on your audio, which is, I feel more precious than just your image, right? The content matters more so i think that so i think yes yeah, so is gonna keep evolving i think this project has to evolve with it as well 
and it might be just a thing that like we'll be 60 years old and still working on this project but with whatever new surveillance elements are kind of in the yeah in the domain it's also taken the shape of a lecture series um so i think yeah this is the tape button uh we mentioned uh yeah, in this slide, uh, we're talking about how asylum seekers in Cardiff were made to wear wristbands so that they could get like um, food from the food bank, um, get on public transports, things like that. It was a way, obviously, f to make them extremely visible and extremely, um, yeah, degrade them on a human level to uh, to make them social pariahs, essentially because the UK has a very hostile environment kind of policy where rather than welcome asylum seekers and immigrants, why don't we just make it so hostile every turn they take until they just willingly um, leave? Because it's once you say, once you get, say that you're willing to leave, they will give, they will get your like an economy class ticket back home in like an hour. Like that's kind of how it works here. But yeah, that's, so that's coding, braiding, and transmissions. Um, related to that is a smaller project that I did that's kind of like the sister to this project. But um, yeah, it's called Mighty Real. It's a it's basically a video project where I asked a friend of mine, Rihanna, to wear one of the GoPro cameras on her wrist and just document her entire 24 hours. and. So you see that on the left of the side of the screen and on the right side of the screen is um, the person, the like government officer who's like surveying her, making a mapping her digital kind of um, footprints and making a, an imp impression of her digitally of like what he thinks she is. But on the left side, you see her like rolling a joint or just like watching TV, or just like doing really mundane stuff. I think those two projects work well together because I mean they've always been together but like they always work together because it's kind of a breather kind of a release valve from a heavy topic like the surveillance of like black people in the in like developed nations and then kind of get a breather of more I think comedic kind of um project going on um I think this is a piece that I'm mostly known for. People have told me that the image on the left specifically is like a meme. I just have to believe them, but like I've never seen it, but people have told me that they're quite familiar with that image. Um, yeah, this is Weaponize the Internet. It was a project I worked with um, Umk Zine, OOMK, one of my kind, um, was for the cover for the issue about the internet and they asked me what I want to do. I said, I want to turn one of your editors into like a really pastiche uh, version of like a matrix hacker, like Darude sunglasses, like trench coat. And we developed the concept further. Um, and we kind of found that like, so they kind of had the idea of like, we can turn them into like a hijabi hacker collective and like they're hacking the people who kind of send them um, angry emails and like death threats. And like, what if they're like hacking these people? Like it's a very conceptual piece, but it's also, um, I guess, imagining if you push people to the extreme, what would happen? Uh, and we, I kind of use more, I'd say, um, like fashion or editorial kind of palette to this because at the time, for whatever reason, I thought I could get a, make a career as a f editorial photographer, but like that was, I needed a, a bit more like nepotism going on in my life with, to get into that. So, but yeah, you can kind of see the fashion editorial elements to this, or like at least like print editorial, something like that. Yeah, this is a project I really love. And uh, I think a lot of people connected to this, which I found also really fun. And it's also like, yeah, I see it a lot. Like a lot of people ask me about it and I tell them, yeah, yeah, it was mostly a fun project and not necessarily you know, dense with and packed with theory or, 
or extremely like transcend some kind of image making. It's actually just more visually captivating or at least more humorous and not, it doesn't take itself too seriously. Uh, okay, back to my essay. I think this is a, yeah, this is the only essay, other essay I'm gonna talk about. Uh, this is an essay called, I think, yeah, it kind of fits back into the other essay I talked about. So for um, PhotoWorks Journal, which is a photo photography journal in the UK, um, yeah, they asked me to they asked me to write an essay for them for like their anniversary issue. And being like a third worldist that I am, or someone who I like hyping really odd things that happen in like the global south and how the global south responds to the things happening in the west. And I said I want to write about uh, counterfeit and fake cameras and how cool they are. And so I wrote basically about the Kiev 88, which was a very brief history on the Kiev 88. Um, during World War II, Russia, after they invaded Germany, they invaded the Hasselblad factory. Hasselblad is like that really famous uh, German camera. And they took, they took all those cameras, went back to Russia and a factory in Ukraine called Arsenal they took it apart, inspected it, and then made their own version, which looked almost identical to the Hasselblad. And for like a fifth of the price, I think it's equivalent to like $17 or something. And a lot of people used it. Uh, it was spread everywhere. I think like my dad had it. So yeah, the Kiev idea is quite a, yeah, it, it's pretty much a copycat, but it, it kind of is emblematic of like, yeah, different ideologies going on. Um, and I'll read, a, I'll read a paragraph. In shape and form, the Kiev 88 bears an eerie resemblance to Zeiss's Hasselblad 1600F, which was released in 1948, nearly four decades earlier. The Kiev 88 was nearly three times cheaper than the Hasselblad, however, and in many ways, Arsenal was acutely aware of what this camera, this new camera was conveying often mockingly called the Hasselbladsky. The general vibe is that the Kiev 88 is a counterfeit Hasselblad 1600F, an illegitimate half-brother. On YouTube, vintage camera vloggers often speak of a dismissive, in dismissive caustic tones. Quote, the Kiev 88 is a very cheap way to get into medium form of cameras, one review began. It's on a tripod worth more than the camera. End quote, uh, that's the title of the essay also. Uh, I think, so I'm not, I don't love this essay because I, I didn't love the process of editing because I've, I only realized later that me and the editor had large ideological differences. I wanted to praise the House of Blood and other fake cameras because I, I thought they were accessible, all their quirks, were interesting. They could reveal more about mechanical reproduction than any other camera would. But at every turn of every other paragraph, I'd get notes that clearly conveyed that for some reason I was hating on the hustle blood or that the points I was making were um, superfluous or, or I don't mean spirited towards like the hustle blood. There's a point, there's a paragraph where I mentioned that the Hasselblad was used by like, um, like oligarchs, like it was a camera that oligarchs used to take their family portraits. It was used by like um, US presidents for like their official like photographs. I, I needed to mention that because this is an expensive camera and it's used in specific societal um, boundaries where certain people can't use it but the editor did not like that. There was even a point where um, I was talking about uh, other counterfeits. So I mentioned how, you know, like fake designer clothes, like Kaiwen Klai, Kuchi, and things like that. And there's a note where the editor said, um, where's the source for this? And I said, there's no source. It's more of like a, a vibe, like, you know, these things exist. 
if you're observant, you know that there's fake products everywhere. Like there's no official website for kyronclyde.com. So I, I think what I'm trying to say basically is that like, it was a big learning point for me to understand that like, I need to approach, if I have ideas that are kind of a bit pro like political and also have a specific, like I had a very specific like third world is kind of um, energy to what I was bringing and they had, they did not have that. And if, if they don't, these two things don't match, then you're gonna, gonna have a very disappointing thing. Like I don't talk about this essay ever because I'm just not proud of it, the process that happened. So as compared to like the piece I talked about with Garage with the piracy, I think that one worked out. I don't know if it's because the editor was Puerto Rican, so she understood how piracy operates in like developing countries versus yeah, in the West. But yeah, I, w I wanted to bring that up because yeah, it was a startling and a big lesson. And I think it's also good for students to know, yeah, who to go to for these, these kinds of things. Uh, okay. Um, the next project, I think this is, this is another project I'm known for, but um, so it's called SIM card project. I made it in 2015. I don't think I'll get too into it because I was quite young when I did this. I think it's my most, I jokingly call it like my most feral, like animal kind of piece because I did it all in like one evening. Like in, it took me like two hours to do this. I took ad photographs that I had taken in Mutuapa, which is in the coast of Kenya. And I was always obsessed with like um, SIM cards and the template of SIM cards and how they look. and. Yeah, so I just slapped, I made my own SIM card, um, SIM cards and like slapped them onto them. And I think at the time I was quite critical of um, telecommunication and how there's only, in Kenya at least, there's only two cell phone providers. And that's obviously a monopoly and restrictive. And I think, I think it should just be like a, I don't know, like, a, the, like the government should take care of it. It shouldn't be like private bodies who have a profit motive. So that was what I, that was the basis of this project. In my fantasy is kind of to um, make it a real functioning, um, like to like rent a cell phone tower. And once you enter the exhibition, you can use <laughs> these SIM cards and obviously once my lease for the cell phone tower is over, like, yeah, you just throw away your SIM card. And I think that was, but this project kind of shows, like I had gestating ideas about the kind of freedoms impeded by kind of these, uh, these apparatus that make up like technology and like all the infrastructures that we have. Like I was already quite critical, even though at the time I just wanted to make like fun template to do with SIM card, because I was obsessed with how SIM cards looked. So yeah, that's kind of, that's some kind of project. I won't go too much into it. Uh, the last thing I want to talk about, wait, we good on time? Okay. Last thing I want to talk about is uh, Diaspora Drama, which is a zine that I made um, a couple of years ago. Basically, I think around, like on Tum Tumblr was quite big. Like I want to say like 2012 onwards and everyone was making zines and all my friends were making zines and I loved zines. I really respect them. I don't know what a zine is. This is basically like a self-published uh, magazine or pamphlet that you circulate around whatever circles you're in. It can be extremely niche or it can be quite broad d depending on what you want to do. Um, often it's printed, um, but I have seen digital zines as well. Uh, so diaspora drama was I was quite, I wanted to make fun of at least how when artists of color or like poets or writers are asked to contribute something, they're usually asked to contribute stuff about their, ident their diasporic identities and like, you know, a poem about like your mother and or, you know, images of like, oh, how you're split between like your differing identities, like, oh, you feel so, um, attached to like your Western life, but like, oh, you also like tradition, like all these things I find very corny. And I also noticed there, there was a burgeoning, like kind of neoliberal, like co-opting of um, these ideas that they were kind of forcing onto us. And so I thought, okay, 
how about I make a zine if called diaspora drama, but it's literally not about that at all. And she wanted it to be about like how extremely online like young people are and the kind of offbeat, weird ideas they had. So I'm gonna just run through a few that are in here. I'll go clockwise. So starting at the top, um, Deborah Finlatter made, wrote an essay about the London, the 2011 London um, riots. And she cleverly juxtaposed it to um, Kirk Franklin, who's a gospel singer and like his music videos and how his music videos had a very like, um, they're very energetic and full of young people. And like, she kind of juxtaposed it with like the, the visuals of the London riots, which are heavily charged because the kids were angry. That was a great, um, yeah, I'm, I'm obsessed with that. Um, in the middle, it's Tabitha Rezer and I'm forgetting the other person that Tabitha um, worked with on this, but I won't, I won't get into too much because you guys literally like know of Tabitha's work, but I was Tabitha early on, early days. Um, the guy on the right is wearing a Donna Kebab New York t-shirt, which I thought it was cool. Um, bottom right is Liz Johnson Archer, who was the singer MIA's like personal photographer at the time. And so, yeah, I just interviewed her and asked her about, because I think MIA is also an artist who also thinks about like the internet and the third world. And I think, yeah, and I've worked with her, so it's quite funny. Um, in this bottom center is um, an editorial that we did, but we did it on Second Life, which is that RPG, like role-playing Sims kind of thing. So we made a whole editorial about that. Um, and then these last two uh, was a video piece. I literally don't remember that video piece, but I know it was a good piece. And over here is um, a girl who basically the Kim Kardashian had like a photo book of all her selfies and she decided to every day to mimic those photos. And I think the Instagram is called like Kim Kardashian every day or every day Kim or something like that. And you can see she did like all 400 pages or something. And in the center is John Yuyi, who's quite a interesting influential artist right now, but yes. And Tom Gale, who's I think Berlin based. But yeah, they made like, iPhone shoelace chargers. This is very much like in the disc magazine kind of aesthetic, I'd, I'd, I'd say so. And here's more, I won't get into these, but yeah, there's more of this, there's more Tabitha and things like that. Um, and I think that's it for me. Uh, Desperate Drama also is available to like download and torrent on my website. But yeah, I'm really proud of this and how it turned out. But yeah, thank you, and that's it for me. Thank Thanks so much, Isaac, um, in this kind of quick overview of, of all, all of your work. I have so many connection points. Um, I know it's almost hard for me to, to see where, where I can start here. But, but I really appreciate your um, openness um, in sharing your approach, your artistic practice that is kind of in between writing and more conceptual and your artistic practice. And, and there you kind of you weave together this like an artistic and social and political and technological discourses. Um, and I'm wondering how, but how does, how does it, your process of making start? Was it always different? Is it because it feels very conceptual. There's like an idea that, that you start to work with and then then the images come or the other way around, or is this, is this changing by, by each project? Um, it's definitely like visuals first, I think. Like, but at the same time, the visuals are based on kind of thoughts. I can't explain it. Like when I was like the first one about the watches, like I just wanted to make a project about watches for a very long time because I was just obsessed with like the kind of signifiers and symbolism with watches. And then, yeah, they kind of just became one. And I don't like my work to be like skeletal, like having just be visually 
interesting or whatever. Like I kind of want thoughts behind it, which is just my approach. I know art doesn't have to be, um, yeah, just like full of ideas, but that's just how I like to do it. And I like to, and oftentimes I'm usually, I, it's usually because I just want to get rid of an idea that's always in my head. Like the best, I just need to get it out of my system. So I stop thinking about it. Like with the watches and the dark web, I was obsessed and constantly thinking about the dark web. I just needed to get it out of my system. And now I, I'm so glad, like I don't think, like I haven't touched the dark web in like two years or something. So that's kind of the approach I get. But yeah, I think also a lot of projects don't call for too much research, but I just do the research anyways, because I'll just start to get really invested and in, very interested in like the like the history of like, oh, I didn't know that the dark web was invented by the US military as like private messaging service between the troops. And then I'll be like, okay, this is clearly like, like a geopolitical element, right? Because like, this is yet another technology, just like, just like Wi-Fi, just like the internet, just like webcams that were actually first made for military purposes. That means I need to dig further and I need to go on and on. And like, I don't, I never see like the research stops at a certain point where I just have to start making work. But yeah, I think it's just the kind of labyrinth that you enter informs the work and informs the visuals. And I do try to be strict with whatever visuals that were interesting to me in the beginning, I have to like stick to it. And like, I have to find a way to incorporate the watches somehow into this dark web thing. I shouldn't let it go because I found it to be visually pleasing for a reason. Because then, I don't know, I should, I should just like submit like a research paper. But no, I want to make an artwork, so I should really stick to that. So that's, yeah, I think that's how I, I, I like to do it. Yeah, beautiful. But I think that's also really, palpable it's like almost you can feel it now that there is there's a very strong conceptual backdrop behind it but it's still playful and um i like the formulation that you just used the, the labyrinth that you enter kind of informs the work and so each time that you engage with a topic it's almost like a you enter a maze or a labyrinth of, of information then i was really um thankful also for your beginning when you kind of talked about also the um, the gray market and uh, generally speaking about this yeah about the people that are existing outside of our functioning society and i think it was a very strong thing that you said that to understand the world that we live in today you have to consider the people who live in the margins or even live outside the margins and um i think that's a big reminder here also within this group for everyone to kind of keep that in mind and i think that's i guess something that we are trying to do here to really think not the mainstream, but all the side alleys and side views um, to, to really get a more complete, even though that's possible, picture of, of really how this, this uh, world works that we live in. And another one and this is, um, is this whole um, thing on un online piracy um, totally um, hit me because I was running a whole master program on what's called Radical Cut-Up at the Sandberg Institute that was like basically offering a master on piracy more or less, no? So yeah. another conversation that we have to have. And, <laughs> and then I was wondering um, from um, what you talked about, from your own experience of kind of being quote unquote uh, uprooted from your motherland, as you said now, and then studying abroad and then starting also with this kind of ironic twist, the diaspora drama in order, as you say, to kind of step away from the tropes or almost the memes of the diaspora tag. Um, mm -hmm. Nonetheless, like what learnings um, like did you take from that nonetheless, or also nonetheless living between Africa and Europe, between Kenya and UK, Nairobi and London, like um, how far do you think these kind of changing people and places, peoples and places have mm -hmm. nonetheless shaped your personal trajectory or artistic trajectory? Um, yeah, well, I wouldn't even say like I was uprooted. Like I kind of, I chose to come here like on like university, like I had, I had a kind of like privilege of like, yeah, making that decision myself. I mean, even though it was like, I guess I was a teenager, so maybe um, my cognitive skills were not fully there yet. To, like, why did I choose the UK of all places? But I, I think, well, start with like diaspora drama. I never asked if like I succeeded in whatever I was doing because 
I might ask someone what they think after reading it and they just they might literally give me the answer that I don't want to hear which is that like oh I love yeah I love like hearing about the, the plight of like diasporic identities or whatever even though that's what I avoided all the time mm. I think I think what I it, it just strengthened all this like back and forth just like kind of strengthens my interest in more so in people who don't necessarily um like live in the west even or like don't like i'm not talking about like materially like physically i mean like don't have a, a pretty alienated to an extent where they are dejected so like that's why i was interested in like that's why i talk a lot about people who are in the margins and outside of the margins like i think that's more um potent for me and but yeah i think in the end i think i've been here i've been here like a decade so my thinking has probably been molded a lot just by my experience in the uk and i think maybe in like a decade once i think i have more mobility and i do the back and forth less concentrated like if i was working in kenya every time i'm in kenya i'm back home to see family or back home to like recharge i'm not necessarily working as an artist there because i don't really have much of a footprint there i people know me to some extent but like i haven't had the time to because i'm just always have to come back here for work or for school so maybe in a decade that question would be more palpable for me right now because i, st- I, st- I still kind of see myself as a london-based artist because a lot of my work is also just about people who are kind of like struggling and going and just like um yeah i don't know like the kind of object violence or just like stepping out of your house in in europe i feel like that's a lot of what my work is about mm-hmm. and i don't know what kind of shape it would look like if i spent more time outside of outside of the uk but yeah that's how things are for me right now and um uh, yeah thank you Anna, for your honesty and also for sharing and um like one of the sub themes of this lecture series is um digitization mm-hmm. it's, it's very well to what you're you know exploring and researching as well with almost all of your works or all of your works and um yeah also the kind of um collaborations that are enabled by digital technologies however you know it's um you know, it's a two-sided thing. So, like, what you see as the potentials and the also the dangers of our like digital information and, and communication technologies. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm very critical, but I'm also, I mean, yeah, that's why I'm like, I can't forget that a lot of these apparatus that we have have origins and like um furthering like the american empire for instance or like a lot of these them are like surveillance tools and things like that so i'll just have to keep that in the back of my mind i am trying i don't want to be like a tech optimist i don't think i've ever been one but like i don't want i i never want to like enter that realm because also just like as someone from i think a lot of my i've also been thinking about this a lot i think The reason, okay, so I've been thinking about like, um, as a lot of people have been about like web 3.0, like NFTs and stuff like that and crypto. And I've been thinking about how like, the reason I don't see anyone in Kenya talk about that stuff is kind of because of skepticism and because we kind of entered, you know, the digital world a bit later than Europe, for instance. And therefore, we kind of don't have the optimism that they have. And we have like the cynicism there from the jump. And that's why I'm also seeing it in Web 3.0 stuff. Like I'm seeing the cynicism already while I'm seeing a lot. Like I'm seeing, at least I'm seeing both praise and cynicism here, but in the UK. So that's kind of where I, like, I, I don't want to, I don't want to praise the kind of, technology that I'm using, like, in the end, there's still apparatus, in the end, like, I don't know, like, they were made by, like, for profit motives, they were not really made to kind of make all lives that much better, because 
if they wanted to make our lives that much better, they wouldn't constantly have to give us updates or like add a feature that they knew we needed. But like they added like two years later, so you buy the new model. Like, you know, there's all these things that just are so obviously like profit driven that it kind of reduces the necessity or like the optimism that I can have about like certain technologies. I'm talking about like iPhones basically, but you know what I mean? Like it's just, there's a barrier for me to ever like fully appreciate it. And I just have to constantly like keep my eyes peeled on them. That that makes sense. Yeah, that makes, and what I was grateful with the, your magazines, for example, is that you kind of reflected on the whole subject of the internet and digital technology, but more from the perspective of like people of color or, um, and, and that's, um, kind of to offer a different angle than the, like the mainstream hegemonic kind of uh, views. And you also brought this idea of electronic kind of colonization a little bit um, into the topic here. But um, yeah. talking about the magazine again, um, what I am also always interested in with every speaker that joins us is like when they work with other artists or other creatives and for a magazine like this, even though it's a sign, um, you have to approach and talk and work with very different personalities and like what's what's your trick or what are your learnings there regarding collaborative creative processes like what well, recommendations can you give there well i guess with diaspora drama i was literally speaking to my age mates and people who were kind of i don't know this was like the first time they've ever been published like with tabitha that was the first time she'd ever been published which i found really shocking and um so like this the level of enthusiasm there like that's very like apparent and they just want to they, they just want to do something because they have so much energy and then then there's the second there's a flip side which is like liz johnson arthur who was uh, the photographer i mentioned who photographed mia and stuff like that um she was later in her career and i think she was more open to being asked i think I don't know who said this, but like, I think a music journalist said, there's only two interesting types of interviews, someone who's very early in their career and someone who's very late into their career. In the middle, it's just not that, it's not that compelling. They're gonna keep telling you the same stuff because they're media trained by by then. But later in their career, they they have the wisdom. They also just don't like, they don't care. <laughs> it, it, like who's, who, who like, they, 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 they're not like watching their words, you know? And so I think, if you were to like kind of, I guess, like curate a show or something early in your career, I would suggest going for like people early in their careers and also people much later in their careers, because you'll also be surprised at how like well-established late career people would just say yes to things or like would answer your call. Like I think they're way more patient than you'd think and they're way more um, appreciative that like a young person is also just interested in them. So that's, 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 that's advice I'd give. That's a really nice one. And this really goes for everyone. It's so true. You know? Like you, like you can definitely knock on every door, and you you'll be surprised how many might actually open up that door, um, yeah, even, totally. even as a student. And um, mm -hmm. then I would be curious, like like what are your inspirations? I'm always curious to learn what people are inspired by. Like what what got you into into all of this? Um, strangely enough, I'm in, I'm inspired by like like films. Like I love like David Lynch. I like how eerie and disturbing his energy is. I always like try to go for that, but then I end up just my stuff being like very clownish and funny, but like, I'm interested in, yeah, how he takes like mundane things like an electric socket and sound and making it very troubling to the senses. Um, I was, I'm interested in a lot, like I would, I watch a lot of documentaries and that's how I kind of think more about like the global South and things like that. Um, but also, I guess a lot of I read a lot of like, like leftist like magazines and small press stuff, and that's how a lot of my think is in thinking is informed, and not necessarily. I mean, there's a lot of artists I do love. Like I love like like Zach Blass. I love um, Peter Campus is one of my biggest inspirations. He's like 60s 70s early like video artist um he had a lot of work to do with like psychoanalysis and like he'd made really interesting video work with with the so little elements 
and yeah, he kind of confused the senses. And I think I like, I like jolting someone with an idea that's kind of stark and a bit unbalanced and uncomfortable, but then later, I guess they ease into it and they become like, all right, this is the thing I'm confronted with. It's not all about me right now. I just have to like experience this and think about and ponder um, it. Because I, like if I, if I introduce people to like really stark concepts, like the dark web or like um, people with no documents and things like that, like it's a very, or like a surveillance state. Like these are very intense, heavy topics. And like, I like to bring in like ambiguity with like the visual elements or like the conceptual elements so that at least I'm not dictating um, to them or giving them like a moral kind of perspective on it because I think the best the best way to be not misunderstood is to be extremely serious but I don't think artists should want to be like always understood I think you should give room for nuance or give room for to be misunderstood or just um like dialogue happening about your work nonstop. I think that's kind of where you want to be at as an artist. <laughs> it's a really it's a, a tweetable moment. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna open up the 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 question now to the whole group. Um, so all of you guys, um, thanks for for sticking with us here. Um, you can ask a question quickly. You can write it also in the chat. Um, and just turn on your camera. For, for that. Let's see if someone is raising their hand. Um, use the opportunity now. I'll, I kind of, uh, I'll, I'll ask another question, but you guys think about some something that you want to ask Isaac maybe here in, in this context. Um, uh, bring ambiguity, uh, ambiguity and give room to be misunderstood is, is, is a very, it's very good, um, very good advice. Um, and um, which is usually my la last question to each participant here is advice. But before that one, um, how, how throughout your kind of career and you're kind of the, the you know, still young, um, but how did, how did you deal, how are you dealing with setbacks in your life? Like what, what have been so far the hardest lesson? for you? Um, I think, okay, so early in the pandemic, I had a, like, there's a video piece that I did called Howard Auditions for Raytheon. Um, Raytheon is that big arms manufacturer in the US. Uh, yeah, it was, because of the pandemic, the funding was slashed, like, almost to like nothing. And I had to like, me and the person I was working with, Steve, um, his name's SL Combs, we had to like couple together something with like that minimal budget. Um, and like, I still want to work on that piece on like some other day somewhere else, but that was a letdown, but it's also, it also let me know that like, I didn't need to do that project then just because I had like, I was, I had like the mindset like, well, this is a pandemic. This is going to be the last piece I ever make. I think it's made me think about just like slowing down and uh, just doing something that was more, um, with more thought and I didn't need to rush it. And like, if the budget's not there, the budget's like, I should probably wait for the budget to come at least, or at least reach a point where it makes sense with the concept. Like I didn't need to, like I didn't need to do the project just because I had to do it. Like I could have, turned it down and waited uh, and then maybe asked for the money in a different way. But that's kind of where, that, that was kind of the setback, but you know, it was a good lesson. You don't always have to say yes to things and the well won't run dry just because um, you said, like well, people don't, people don't gossip, like there's no room to, like people don't know each other like, like that in the art world. So like if you say no to something, it doesn't mean it doesn't mean every door will shut down, shut on you. So that's yeah, that's kind of that's kind of where I'm at. I, I can very much relate to that. I feel like last year I also said yes to two things, too too many things, and I oh, only, yeah. I could only do them at seventy percent. And then you, nobody can tell, but I can always tell that it's only seventeen or a hundred. And that's uh, yeah, 
the frustrating. I also wonder, like, is it? Do they not? Tell? Like, I'm always curious. Like, can they not tell? Like, maybe they can. But I don't know. I I don't think anybody noticed except for yourself. Oh, there's a question coming, um, by Irene. I'll read it. Okay. So no, I don't have a question. I just want to say that I find it very inspiring how you dig so deep in a lot of your projects. I personally find this very hard to do since I get distracted and lose myself in all the information. So sometimes I stay in the shallow waters when there's so much more. Yeah, what's your advice? Uh, by the way, that's something I think we can all relate to. I, I can relate to that too, by the way, Irina. But uh, yeah. Huh, I think... <sighs> Okay, I think you kind of also, like, you have to think, like, what is, um, like, what's the, okay, so imagine you had, uh, this is what I tell some of my students sometimes, you had, like, one idea, right? Like, let's say your idea, okay, I'll use one of my projects, for example, like, let's say your idea was um, watches, so you have an axis that's going up this way, but you also want another axis that's going another way, and that other way is um, your the new idea that you found because the new ideas you found because of um the research that you're doing or like because of um all your personal findings or whatever but those two have to like go up at the exact same time like if if the idea of the idea of the watches like had to visually be elevating at the exact same time i'm doing the doing the uh, the research and they had to be at the same level at the at the exact time otherwise one would shoot up another way the information would just keep going until like it's lost somewhere and then i'll never know how to get back to the other one so i think if you think of it that way and literally like draw on your notebook like that's how i had a student who kind of had the same thing like she wanted to uh yeah do a project about okay maybe she didn't remember but it was about like the city and like yeah the neighborhoods she was in but then she kept interviewing people in her neighborhood and then she got like and i was like okay well are you still doing this video piece about your neighborhood? Like, what does it look like? And she's like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what it's gonna look like. I was then I kept telling her, keep thinking about what it's gonna look like as you're doing those interviews. Otherwise, it's just, you're just gonna. Otherwise, you're just gonna have a thesis, or you're just gonna have just write a book. But yeah, I'd say you have to keep them parallel at all times before you dip. I hope that helps, um, Irene. Do you have any, any more questions from you guys? Um, I have another question. Oh, yeah, Philippe, you have a question. Hi. Uh, well, uh, wait, I want to ask you, how do you think sitting down like that influences coding? Like, what what do you think that position does to someone or like what it does to like the, the stuff that's out there? Yeah. yeah. I wonder if someone has ever looked in, 
that's very interesting. I wonder if someone's ever actually looked into like the physicality of coding and like what that does to not just your brain, but like the output. I feel like, yeah, maybe there is something there with like, um, I mean, obviously like how your senses are, um, like where you are dictates also like, yeah, everything about like what, what you're going to make. So I'm, I don't know. I feel like that's, a, I think that's something you should look into because I'm really fascinated. With that. <laughs> I, have a, I, have a, um, I have a nice anecdote here. I was thinking about that. And um, so I'm, I'm a bit of a moon nerd. Yeah. So I wrote this book called Memories of the Moon, moon Age, which kind of looks into the cultural history of mankind's dream of flying into moon, to the moon. And um, there's actually, there, there's actually an example that kind of fits into that subject. So for example, the like the safe arrival of the Apollo 11 mission, no, like that landed on the moon for that a computer was like literally knit together. So they had a and I'm not kidding here. They had a team of like ex textile workers and I think this is good for you and watchmakers. Yeah. You both <laughs> both things together who were employed to like literally weave, um, the software into the memory of the kind of um, Apollo guidance computer, it's APG called. And so they're, they're, there's like, it's woven into, I'm not a tech expert, but I'll give you the, it's woven into copper by, by kind of drawing copper threads through or around little like magnet cores to represent the zeros and ones that constitute the program. But it's, it's literally, oh. it is, I mean, this is the craziest thing about the whole, I mean, can spend your whole life just thinking about the Apollo mission, the, the type of stuff that was invented that just didn't exist. But these, this, this program was literally woven by ex, old ladies, basically, and, and watchmakers and textile workers who knitted the program. That's very interesting. Oh my God, yeah. that's, that's yeah. wild. I had no idea. Yeah, but actually, that's yeah. the, the type of nerdy stuff if you go too deep into the rabbit hole. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, wasn't the Apollo mission like those just like new technologies that were only made for the Apollo mission as well? And, like, yeah. Kind of None of it existed. I actually and, think, yeah. Oh no, sorry. Yeah. No, I was thinking if there's any more questions from from you oh, guys. I actually, I kind of have an answer for Felipe. Actually, I think. Um, so I was reading this book, "Bullshit Jobs," um, by the late David Graeber, and he was saying. When, when people talk about like working class jobs, people are always talking about like factory work, like, you know, producing things, hammers and things like that. But that's kind of like, le like there's less of those manual labor jobs and more of like the caring economy. So like people who are nurses, um, even like ticket booth at like your st train station telling you, like you ask them like, oh, how do I get to this place? Or like, someone helping like a drunk guy on like getting to his train that's like the caring economy right and i think hairdressers kind of enter the caring economy because they are helping someone like get a hairstyle that can like make them feel proud and like help with their self-esteem but also they have to hair care for the actual hair follicles and like not put the person in pain right so braiding can be seen as something that's in the caring economy whereas coding is not in the caring economy because it's not it's kind of alienated from like human touch to some extent and so maybe if someone was coding and braiding like that's that would not like alienate them from like a human experience to some extent like maybe they'll be more sympathetic humanistic they'll have like empathy going on as they code and maybe we won't have you know certain apparatus in the world that is so um detrimental to society even though it was made to like help society I literally thought of this in two minutes, so that's that's the that's that's my answer to you, Felipe. Okay, good. But you, you're leaving us enough sketches to kind of start new projects. <laughs> and, and guys, I'm, 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 I would come to kind of a wrap up if there's no more questions from you guys. I have my our last um, last question that we asked everyone. But is there before I ask that, guys, any more questions? It's also. Um, uh, ah, yeah. Um, oh, the book okay. again. absolutely. It's called. Wait, it's. I think it's reverse. Oh, I'll just write it down. Oh. And for um, for you guys listening, um, I put the um, in Moodle. You find a link to the uh, the magazines, not the online versions. And okay, then um, coming. Coming to our last question now, also for you, Isaac, and kind of did it already, but you can do it again. Like, what 
piece of advice could you give all the becoming artists, designers, architects, and so forth, musicians listening to us today? Um, aside from the other advice I gave, um, I would say, um, this is kind of a weird one, but like, only take advice from people you want to become. I think that's, that's the best advice I've ever gotten. So just because someone's like accomplished in your industry, but you don't want to become them, like there's certain artists who are, I could like, I could find a way to like have lunch with them and they will tell me all about the steps they took to become the artists that they are right now. But what if I don't want to become that type of artist? I want to become another type of artist. So I would instead have lunch or email that other person who I just, I've seen their trajectory. I've seen the work they make. I've seen the kind of galleries they work with. I've seen the kind of, you know, partnerships they do. I want to become them. I only ask them. I wouldn't ask another person just because they're accomplished. I think that's the best advice I could give. That's a really, really good one. Really, really good one. I really appreciate that. Um, well, then, thank you so much, Isaac. Thank you guys for being with us here today. Um, uh, it's been a pleasure. Um, in your words, um, consider the people who live in the margins and beyond and yeah. g give room to be misunderstood. That's a beautiful, beautiful advice, too. Um, I, I really cherish this one. Uh, that said, um, Isaac, I hope um, we will have many more um, many more times our paths will cross and there's many subjects I think that we can dive deep into. Um, goodbye for now and goodbye to you guys too. Um, stay safe, take care and see you hopefully then next week for a conversation with hands down probably the world's most famous cu curator, Hans Ulrich Ovest. Uh, so keeping fingers crossed and stay safe. Thank you. Take care guys. Bye. I think really enjoyed it. Take care.